On Tech News Today, killer phones and smartwatches unveiled at Mobile World Congress, Google lobbies to keep Google Glass legal, and Bitcoin is under attack. All that and more coming up next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's Tuesday, February 25th, 2014, and this is Tech News Today. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TNT2. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Mike Elgin. I'm Jason Howell. Tech News Today explores the most important stories of the day in conversation with the world's leading journalists. Our guest a uh, co-anchor this week is Natalie Morris, a contributor to the Today Show, CNBC, the Queen Latifah Show, and she's a former anchor for CNET TV. She's also the co-founder of ReadQuick, a speed reading app for iOS. Welcome again, Natalie. Thank you. Good to be back. So this speed reading app is really cool. I've used it, and it's very unusual. Can you describe how this works? Yeah, it's a speed reading app that allows you to save stories either to your pocket queue or your Insta paper or just look something up on the web. And it displays the articles one word at a time because when you're reading, a lot of times you sound out the words either with your lips or in your head. And it sort of allows you to not do that by displaying the words as an image. Your body or your brain actually understands that word in, a di in that sentence contextually a lot different than if you were to see it as a whole sentence. So I I use it to prepare for shows like Twit or Tech News Today um, because we have a long list of things we need to read so I can get through it a lot faster. And I use this for long form content a lot. And I still use to, I still do also, you know, read the newspaper in the old world form. But this is really great for a lot of uh, digital news that you want to get through. You know, the web is so crowded with all of these news stories and we sure. always feel like we need to see more than we can. So this helps. Absolutely. It feels a little bit like some kind of strange voodoo because when you use it, uh, and again, I've used it many times, it feels like you're reading kind of slowly. It feels leisurely. But then when you time yourself, it's like twice as fast. Yeah. And it gives you a timer for how long you can complete each article. And, you know, my husband, he goes in the four or five hundreds. I don't do that. I go in the low three hundreds because I'm, I just don't see the need to go that fast. I know. Yeah. I don't feel the need for speed that much. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, we don't have an Android version yet. We're working on it. Uh, it's just something that we funded in our house because we're both <laughs> news reporters. And I know, that's, Jason, that's, I'm sorry. Dave, get an Android we're, version yeah, of this out just, there. We're, we just found an Android <laughs> developer, actually. Awesome. I mean, this I is just wait. something that my husband and I, you know, made up because we felt the need for it. Because he's yeah. a news anchor. And so he goes in in the morning and he has to read so many stories to get rid of, ready for the show at 4 a.m. It just really helps to get through it faster. Well, awesome. it's, it's very cool. And uh, speaking Thank of, you. <laughs> speaking, speaking of reading and doing the news, let's go ahead and get started. Mobile World Congress, of course, is well into day two. So far, we've seen rumors confirmed and a few surprises. Kevin Tofel is the mobile editor at GigaOM, and he's here to tell us about what he's uh, seen at uh, Mobile World Congress or from Mobile World Congress. He's not actually there, uh, but we're all watching it very closely. So uh, uh, what, is, uh, what have you seen out of Mobile World Congress so far that has impressed you the most, Kevin? So, you know, there's a lot going on at Mobile World Congress. It's no different than any other year. But I think the, the big stories here or the biggest uh, advances in terms of devices are the uh, Nokia X Android phone that's kind of bridging the gap between Nokia Asha phones and Microsoft's Windows phone. Everyone's wondering, is Microsoft going to keep this or not? I th certainly think they will. And I think it's a good move for, for Nokia to do this because it, it gives people in emerging markets a way to experience the Microsoft brand and, and experiences that they wouldn't otherwise have. And when those folks are ready to go up to a bigger smartphone, a better smartphone, that's where Microsoft steps in and says, hey, try our Lumia Windows phones. So that's definitely one. And then, of course, the big news is the Galaxy S5 from Samsung and has all the bells and whistles as you would expect, of course. But I'm actually more intrigued by the Galaxy uh, Gear Fit or the Gear Fit from Samsung. Yep. It's a wearable device, and it's actually one that I, I would wear. The Galaxy Gear, the original one, I was not a big fan of. Too many features, too bulky. But this kind of is a 
I'll call it a, a smartwatch light version. It's got some basic notifications and it's got lots of health tracking things. So I think Samsung is finally starting to listen to consumers who say, hey, you've got too much stuff in your products here. Let's let's tone it down a bit and make it more useful. And it looks so much different from the other wearables. So it seems like they're really willing to try a bunch of stuff. They're, you know, it's not like their last version of this, of, of a wearable. So, um, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I really like the way this looks too. But let me ask you a question, Kevin. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires a, a, a Samsung phone. Is, is that a showstopper for you? Well, I, I love my Moto X. So sorry, Samsung, no sale. Um, I'm in exactly know. the same boat. I have a Moto X. I'm not going to switch to a Samsung device. I probably would have purchased this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and you'd mentioned the, 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 the Nokia X phones. These things fall into the same category. In both cases, Here's an opportunity for companies, in the one case possibly an opportunity met and the other probably missed, where a company can, uh, by making their, you know, by embracing uh, uh, other platforms, other products, uh, competitive products, you can sort of create a gateway drug into your products. And, and so, you know, I can, I can see Microsoft, for example, uh, continuing to offer the Nokia X line even as they... Uh, fin finalize the acquisition of the Nokia mobile division. And that would be a really smart thing to do. And I could see Samsung uh, opening this thing up to work with all Android phones and maybe even iOS phones. That'd be really smart, but I don't, you know, they, it doesn't look like they're going to do that. And they certainly haven't done this kind of thing in the past. Don't you think that's a, a huge missed opportunity? I would agree with you. I'll give them a pass on the Galaxy Gear, which came out in the fall. Uh, that only worked with Galaxy phones, mainly because it needed Bluetooth 4.0 low energy, and very few Android devices had that at the time, except for Samsung's own. But that that scenario has changed by and large. Our Moto X is my, has Bluetooth low energy. I use it with uh, my Fitbit Force, for example, works fine. So I, I agree with you, Samsung is missing an opportunity to expand the product availability across or outside of their own lines. And we've seen companies that release a new product that only pairs with their thing. We saw this a lot when companies were doing sort of tablets to phones or what was the one that had the, the tablet that then came into the keyboard that worked with the phone and the that never phone. works, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> say it again, Jason. The pad phone it? by Asus. The pad phone, right. Um, so we've seen that before, but you notice that there's no price yet for this Samsung device. So we could be, th they could be thinking of bundling this together. So you don't, so you buy it with the phone and it's so much cheaper because of it. Um, it's just, that's never worked as a pricing model before because it's not the incentive that consumers use. Like, oh, I was going to get this one, but because of the watch, I'll get this one instead. You know, um, it has to be a standalone product, I think. Although uh, in Citatus, I think how we say his name in the chat room points out that if and when Apple releases their smartwatch, it will only be iOS. So we have to slam them together for this like apple will do the same thing we know that right but, right. yeah but but in the android world there are a lot of other androids out there what what i wonder you know versus apple in the apple world where it's just ios devices it's a very limited number of devices so it kind of makes a little bit more sense in that regard but i want i really have to ask myself about samsung's strategy and all of this i understand where they're coming from they really want to play the same game that apple is doing with their ios devices and say well hey you're you're in the samsung ecosystem so you're going to be so excited about our products when you own one that you're going to want all of them but don't they stand to gain so much more by opening it up to the rest of the devices? And it, are there enough Samsung diehard people to buy those products in the way that Samsung wants them to for it to be, I mean, for it to make way more sense than just opening it up entirely? Clearly, because otherwise, what's the point of using Android? You might as well have your own operating system, right? I mean, mm -hmm. except like the apps. Like Tizen. Mm -hmm. And I mean, right. and as far as we know, these, these gear devices are running Tizen mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's pretty astonishing. Another weird trend, uh, not weird, I think it's a, actually kind of a cool trend uh, among the major providers is water resistance and waterproof devices. Uh, of course, the uh, Samsung is water resistant, dust resistant, and Sony launched their Z2 phone and tablet, which are both waterproof. And in fact, Sony has been ha you know offering waterproof phones for a while, and they show... You know, they market it by showing, you know, people in a swimming pool underwater, taking pictures underwater. It's a really cool feature, and it actually, in a way, reminds me of the pad phone. When see, people see stuff like that, like the pad phone or waterproof devices, they say, yeah, that's what I want. 
when they come to buy something, they don't choose based on that oftentimes. But I do like the trend. I do like the idea of, and I'd love to see all phones. I wish my Moto X was waterproof. I'm always afraid I'm going to drop it in some water or get it wet somewhere. So that's a cool feature. I just wonder if, uh, uh, Kevin, do you think this is something that um, the consumers are really going to start uh, making their choices around, around waterproof and water resistance and, and dust resistance? Oh, I, I think there's a definite market for those types of uh, features because so many people up in, uh, say, uh, northeast, I'm sorry, northwest uh, United States where they get more rain and such. I mean, there's a lot of moisture in the air. I, I talk to readers all the time and they're like, yeah, I wish I had, you know, moisture resistant phone or something, you know, that I, I could drop in water accidentally and still it would work. I, I think this is a, a big step forward for that. I, Samsung has often done this with their devices, they've offered a waterproof and dustproof version of their other devices. They call them the active line. Hopefully they're getting rid of the active line, just blending all this together into one phone, which looks like that's what they're doing. I, I think that's great because that, you know, this is a, a feature that anybody can benefit from. I mean, it, we all have water around us between, you know, bath water and uh, washing dishes and such. So I, I think it's a great thing to have. Not to mention the toilet, which is always a problem. <laughs> always have a sack of rice uh, available ready. Uh, maybe that'll dry out your phone in time to uh, save I have it. A, I have a waterproof Xperia tablet, and, um, you know, it's waterproof, but you have to make sure the charging port is closed. Yes. Is, are most of these phones the same way? You have to make sure the charging port is closed, or are the charging ports also waterproof? Um, for the know? most part, I think I think for the most part, they, they still have these covers that you're yes, referencing. Yes, they have the covers. Yeah, there okay. are a few that are completely waterproof, even if you have those covers open, but those are uh, f few and far between at the moment. Whatever I happened would imagine that's hard to engineer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It, I'm sure it is. And it'd be great if they could figure out how to do it very gracefully with, without having to cover it. That way it's truly water resistant. But whatever happened to that? What was that? There, there was a chemical dip or some kind of thing you could spray on a phone from a CES a couple of years ago that made any phone waterproof. Whatever happened to that? I don't see people using that. Is that the phone I, soap? Was that what that was called? Foam uh, soap? I don't recall. I, I, or was I see... that the um, the chemical that makes it not? Gross? Yeah, it was a there was a comp. Yeah, Liquitel, something Liqui like Liquipel. That. Liquipel, there we go. There we go. Yeah, there thanks, go. thanks, chat room and, and, and Jason. That's that's exactly what it was. I, I remember thinking, okay, we're, we're about to usher in a new age of waterproof everything, and uh, I guess I guess it's an option. Um, I just uh, <laughs> don't see a lot of people using it. For when we all live in Aquarius or That's something. That's right. That, that I mean, it's not that serious, everyone. Like, yes, water is bad for gadgets, but... And don't drop it in the toilet. That's, That's all right. I'm saying. Sage advice, Jason. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you may have noticed that uh, that Kevin is wearing an amazing pair of Google Glasses. This is the new uh, prescription uh, style of Google Glass uh, that goes with your regular prescription uh, lenses. Uh, and Google is working hard to make the world safe for Google Glass. The company's lobbying state officials to stop them from banning Google Glass behind the wheel. Uh, all of this raises the question, is driving while wearing Google Glass dangerous? What do you think, Kevin? Is it, uh, is it dangerous to wear Google Glass while driving? I know you've done it. Uh, well, everyone knows I've done it because in that post, I actually put pictures of me driving from you know, with Google Glass. So I'm probably going to go to jail or get a ticket for that post. But, um, you know, I, I see both sides to this, Mike. Clearly, safety should always be, first and foremost, the most important thing when it comes to being behind the wheel of a car or any other vehicle for that matter. Um, I don't find, though, through my own usage, that Google Glass really distracts me when I'm driving. Um, there are so many other distractions everybody's already dealing with. Just looking down at your radio, looking at your GPS in-car navigation, you know, looking at signs that are going by as you are driving. All these things are moving, taking your eyes off the road. You know, I have a choice to interact with glass when I'm driving or not. And I mean, you, somebody had said it best, you can't legislate common sense and common sense dictates don't get, don't go down the rabbit hole of glass and looking for more and more information from it while you're driving. You need to be a responsible driver at all times, no matter you know, whether you're wearing glass or not. Okay, but in your point, in your post, you talk about how you are for legislation that restricts texting while driving. And isn't that, in a sense, legislating common sense? Like, you should not text while you drive. A lot of idiots do it. Sure, and it's a fair point. And it's one that it's it's actually something I used to do quite a bit of, and I'm glad that I no longer do it. And I don't do it because it's, it's the law. I do it because now it's smart. Um, that's, that's a fair point, a fair question. I think... There's a difference between smartphones when you're driving and Google Glass when you're driving. And I think it's something you can't appreciate until you've actually driven using both. Uh, having said that, 
Um, when I used a smartphone while I was driving, I, again, it's something you have to reach for, something you have to look down. Then you've maybe got to unlock it. You have more interaction points that are distractions as opposed to glass. You know, to send a text, it's voice, it's voice centric. So I don't really need to be unlocking devices, going to the right app and doing things like that. So I see this as less of a distraction. And that's why I said, you know, I can understand it, why, why we've legislated it on a smartphone. But can we also think of this not from a technological standpoint, but from a neurological standpoint? There's plenty of research out there that says the human brain just is not good at multitasking. And that's a virtue that for some, it's not even a virtue. It's something we considered a virtue at one point in time, which I don't think we should. So can we sort of wrap our brains around all of this information while we're doing something that is very dangerous and you can take other people. I'm not trying to lead the witness here and obviously I'm <laughs> You're badgering I, I'm the getting witness. Fired up. I'm, I'm sorry I'm getting fired up about it and I don't mean to be so partisan but you know a, a car is a dangerous thing. You can kill my family with it, right? So why are we being so capricious about something that may or may not be dangerous if it can be dangerous? No doubt about it. And I don't think you should apologize for feeling passionate about it. We should be discussing that. That's kind of the point of why I wrote the post. I mean, yes, I put my own perspective into it to share that perspective, but I think this is a conversation that needs to be had. And I spoke with Google earlier this morning and, and they agree. This is, they want to be part of this, that conversation. Um, it, there's no question it can be distracting. I'm not, I'm not going to argue that, but I would argue that there's so many things that are already in cars that can be equally as or more distracting. So how do we determine uh, what is or isn't distracting when driving? You know, are, are we not going to look at our, our speedometer anymore, even with a heads up display for speedometer? Yes, I think that's better, but really glass is a heads up display as well. So where's the difference? These are all but what great is the questions. point of banning it now? Isn't there some kind of unconscionableness about it? Like, we don't know, it's not out there enough, so we don't need any legislation. When it could, even if it saves one life, is that not enough? I, I Believe me, I'm all for saving as many lives as possible. Um, I think part of the issue here is that glass itself is a new paradigm, it's a new device. And yes, we should question if it's distracting. Yes, we should question if there needs to be legislation. My take is it may be too soon for that because as Google has said, you guys are trying to legislate a product that's not even commercially available to everyone. It may change. It has it changes every month based on the functionality with their software updates. And actually in my post, I did say I would love to see a technical solution to this problem, just like on the Moto X that we referenced yeah. earlier in the show. Yeah. I've got a great, great technical solution for that with the Moto Assist. And mm -hmm. what that software does is it says, hey, I'm smart enough to realize that Kevin's driving right now, so I'm going to shut off all notifications except for any incoming calls or texts from his family. Yep. And when those come in, I'm going to actually speak those aloud. So I would actually like to see something like that looked at first before we just blanket summarily dismiss Glass. Yeah, that's a good point. The case, there, yeah. the case in favor of Google Glass uh, goes something like this. Uh, there are apps coming out already, even though Google Glass is not available in the market, that can save lives. For example, there's one... Uh, glassware app that if you nod as if you fall asleep you nod forward the motion detector in glass will zap you with the with the bone conduction and and wake you up and, and <laughs> flash an alert saying hey it looks like you're falling asleep we'll pull over uh, there's another app that will t alert you to upcoming hazards and things in the road uh, and yet another uh, point to be made is that uh, one of the built-in basic functions of Google Glass is turn-by-turn -turn directions now people already use uh, a GPS in their cars either mounted in the car, oftentimes on the dash, sometimes they use their phone, sometimes they hold their phone, sometimes it's it's in a, a cradle. When you use uh, uh, navigation, again, this is very common to use navigation, turn-by-turn uh, -turn directions on a phone or a device. If it's on the dash, it's actually covering part of your field of view. With Google Glass, it's covering a similar part of the field of view. It's essentially the glass uh, the screen is about where the mirror is in your car. It's up and off to the side, except for a slight turn of the head puts it out of the way. You can move it around by just turning your head, which you can't do with devices mounted on the car. And 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 for people holding a phone, using one hand to hold a phone, which again is very common, and they have to look all the way down to see it, that's very that's way more dangerous than getting turn by turn directions from Google Glass. Okay, so here's my solution. I thought about this a lot. If someone wants to create it, I want some credit. Is a Chromecast to your windshield. 
and then you get that hmm. directions right there. What do you think? So, so a heads-up display on the windshield. Yeah. Do you like it? I like it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Someone so go make it. We recorded this, so this is out there. This is like first prior, whatever it is in the patent world. You put world. your Chromecast right in your cigarette adapter, and then you got the turn-by-turn -turn directions right on your windshield. And you don't have to look down at anything. I'm not even sure Google has thought of Chromecast in the car yet. Yeah. You could be the first, Natalie. Yes. <laughs> I'm a genius. Yeah. The only downside is idea. The only downside is somebody's gonna put flappy birds on that on that window. That's right. And the other, the other downside is the other downside is they're always already using the Google Drive brand. Too bad. That's true. <laughs> well, we're gonna talk in a second about uh, Bitcoin and all of its many troubles, but first I want to tell you about Gazelle. Well, actually, you know, before we go to that, I want to say goodbye to Kevin. Uh, you were with us with two two uh, stories, and, and I appreciate you also showing us your Google Glass. But thank you for your insights on both of these st stories, Mobile World Congress and Google Glass while driving. Everybody should read his article on Google Glass while driving. It's really fascinating. So thank you for joining us, Kevin. My pleasure. And everybody drive safe. Yes. <laughs> you can find uh, Kevin, of course, at gigaohm.com and on Twitter at Kevin C. Tofel. That's T-O-F-E-L, uh, again, on Twitter. Well... I'm going to tell you about Gazelle because this is a fantastic company. They will buy your used gadgets. Why would you want to sell your used gadgets? So you can buy new gadgets. And it's also environmentally friendly because they put those gadgets back into circulation, which means that somebody doesn't have to buy a brand new phone somewhere, which means a phone doesn't have to be manufactured, which lo reduces, theoretically, the number of phones that are manufactured. And that's better for the environment. So... How do you use Gazelle? Well, it's very simple. You go to gazelle.com. That's G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. Find the item that you have that you'd like to sell. Uh, just simply say if it's in good condition or broken or cracked or flawless or whatever. And then they'll put up a price there. You can see uh, that $270 for that one device on the screen uh, if you're watching. And, you know, they will honor that price for 30 days. That means that you don't have to worry about that. that you know, of course, these devices always reduce in value over time because they're getting older. But that price is locked in for 30 days so you can take your time. They'll send you a free box in most cases. Simply put it in the box, send it back, and they will pay you. So how do they pay you? Well, they pay you by check or PayPal, or if you use their Amazon gift card option, they'll pay you an extra 5%. It's like free money. So I recommend that option. It's the one that I have used. Um, and again, Gazelle will wipe your data for free. So if you have your personal data on there, uh, they will take care of it so it won't get into the wrong hands. Uh, and you can uh, rely on their professional methods of, of, of uh, wiping the data. They have 700,000 happy customers to whom they've paid more than $100 million. So go to gazelle.com today and find out what your iPhone is worth. Uh, do it now because your iPhone may lose value the longer you wait. Well, Bitcoin is under attack in many ways. The Bitcoin exchange Mt. Gox, which is based in Japan, is offline now after it reported uh, a theft of all of its Bitcoins. The site uh, issued a statement a couple hours ago that say that they're, they decided to, quote, close all transactions for the time being in order to protect the site and our users. I don't know what they're protecting. All the money has gone as far as I know. And separately, a virus called Pony is stealing Bitcoins. The security firm Trustwave said the Pony botnet has nabbed about 85 virtual Bitcoin wallets that they know of and, and that those and also those from other digital currencies. Uh, with us to discuss this is Richie Jennings, who's an independent writer and analyst specializing in security and who writes for ComputerWorld.com and other publications. Welcome, Richie. Hey, good morning, Mike. How are you? Fantastic. Well, Bitcoin seems to be taking quite a, a beating these days. Uh, are these attacks the, uh, in any way related as far as you know? No, not as far as I know. Uh, from the look of the leaked document, although we can't be sure of its provenance, that um, was found by so-called, uh, uh, what did he call himself? The two-bit idiot. The two-bit idiot. Uh, possibly his name Great is man. Ryan Galt. His, uh, <laughs> the, the, this crisis, uh, crisis management strategy draft uh, that got leaked around the, the web uh, the, uh, last night, it basically says, you know, look, we we had a bunch of vulnerabilities in the code. Uh, code wasn't very well written. Uh, we really need to be publicly blaming the CEO and and being seen to boot him out. But we can't because we're a Japanese company and there are legal reasons why you can't just boot out a CEO from a Japanese company unless you have a replacement. So we kind of have to be in a holding pattern right now. But we've lost a lot of, of people's money or people's 
imaginary money. <laughs> so, but the good news is that we're all ready to do a rebrand and we won't be called Mount Gox anymore. We'll be called Gox. And separately, I was contacted this morning by someone who described themselves as, as a domain name specialist who said, oh, I, I understand that Mount Gox bought Gox.com recently. Yep. Which, so yeah. for what it's worth. And, and, that, the, and the Gox.com website now redirects to Mount Gox.com oh, and to where uh, you can see a blank page. Uh, right, because, there you go. Yeah, and, and Gox sounds like, what is that? Sounds like a, a, a Dr. Seuss character or it something, does. doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That's your culture, not mine. I'll, I'll take your word for it. Now, interestingly, <laughs> this, this bizarrely worded Dear Mount Gox Customers page that we currently see on mountgox.com was not there this morning, well, this morning, my time, like eight hours ago, um, when, when I was looking at this and compiling a quick story for Computer World, which you quickly flushed up, flashed up there. Thank you. Um, what actually appeared there then was apparently a blank page. But if you looked at the source, there was an HTML comment in there that appeared to talk about an acquisition, or at least it says, put announce for Mount Gox ACQ here. Now, does that, does that mean that they were working on an acquisition announcement? Does ACQ stand for something else? Is it a feint? Was that something that was there from some, for some other reason? Who knows? But great to speculate. It makes us so glad that we have the FDIC here in the United States, which insures our money in the actual banks that we put it in. Do you think there'll ever be something like that for Bitcoin, some kind of insurance policy, or is it still well, just the, the wild, wild the, west? Natalie, 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 don't you realize that these are fiat currencies and they're not backed by anything real and they're actually more... Um, they're more risky than than Bitcoin and Dogecoin and all of these other uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, uh, you can't trust any governments, surely. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, 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 I kid, of course, if you can't tell. Um, I love the incredible amount of post-justification that I'm seeing today. It's like, kind of like a mix between post-justification and confirmation bias on both sides of the argument. Um, all of the comments that I've seen today both on uh, attached to my piece, uh, on other blogs, uh, and also the comments on uh, a Hacker News submission, uh, a, a Y Combinator Hacker News submission uh, of my Computer World piece this morning, um, basically fall into two buckets. Either, uh, oh, I knew this Bitcoin thing was a complete waste of time. I knew it would fail. I knew it all along. I've been telling everyone, just, this just proves it. Bitcoin is dead. And people on the other side saying, no, 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 Bitcoin isn't dead. Uh, Mt. Gox was just a, 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 a rogue exchange. Uh, in fact, I knew Mt. Gox was, was, a, was a terrible exchange. I knew they were set up badly. Uh, I knew this all along. And uh, uh, this just goes to prove how smart I am. Yeah, we see that uh, in the chat room, actually. I'm watching the chat room say the exact <laughs> sentiment. Some people are like, oh, it's fine. It'll be fine. It's just one example. And then the rest of them are uh, like, what, if, what is, it, is Bitcoin? What the heck? The yeah. problem is that um, if, if, the, if the public is divided 50-50, that's enough to completely crash the value of the currency, uh, which is apparently happening, isn't it? Uh, I understand that the, the well, the values vary depending on which exchange you, you look at, but the values have been bouncing around the... $500 mark, uh, mm -hmm. which is a considerable discount from where they were uh, 24, 48 hours ago. Yeah. So now's the time to rush in if you still believe in the Bitcoin fairy. Well, Richie. I'm not touching that. I'm not touching <laughs> that. Uh, anyone who is mad enough to take investment advice from me uh, <laughs> deserves everything they get. All right, Richie. Well, thank you for uh, illuminating this, uh, this topic. We'll be watching it closely. And uh, again, thanks for uh, Skyping in from, uh, from the UK. My pleasure, Natalie, Mike, and Jason. Great to talk to you. All right, thanks again. Uh, you can they don't, find they don't um, listen. They don't read Dr. Seuss in the UK. I'm sure they do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Such a smart guy. I didn't know the Dr. Seuss but, reference. <laughs> but I don't have children. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you were once one, right? I assume. Uh, a very, very long time ago. <laughs> All right. Well, thank thank nice you again. You. Thank you for joining us, Richie. Easy. All right, Bye. you can find Richie on Twitter at uh, Richie R I C H I, which is a great, tr great Twitter handle. 
Excellent. Well, um, LinkedIn is trying to become the first major U.S. social network to launch a Chinese language version. Uh, Natalie, this is a, a pretty bold move. Um, and uh, one of the bold things about it is that they know the government is going to censor them. They have already come out with a statement uh, in opposition of censorship, but also t uh, preparing uh, everyone to know that they are going to abide by whatever the Chinese government tells them to do. And, um, you know, what do you think about this? Is this the right thing for a uh, for a social network like this, especially one that is based on credibility and business, for them to go in knowing that they're going to be censored? How do you feel about that? Right. Well, LinkedIn is not the um, pioneer of web freedom, right? We see Google and Facebook. They're not on mainland China. They're not in mainland China for these reasons. They want to fight the good fight, right? But LinkedIn, their reputation is that they're on the up and up, and that you know. Whatever the Chinese government mandates is a okay, and I mean, what could really? I don't. I haven't thought it through. What are the use cases in which the Chinese government can really offend LinkedIn? Um, what yeah. are they trying to share on there? That's you know, th like they're not going to be fighting the fight to have breastfeeding pictures on yeah. there. Like, who does that on right. Facebook? Exactly. Maybe someone who runs La Leche League. I don't know. Yeah, um, who knows? Well, the, the CEO uh, Jeff Weiner uh, has basically said he doesn't know what the nature of this. Uh, government control will be. Uh, they, they do believe they'll be able to double their user base. Um, they're hoping that the site will attract 140 million Chinese professionals. Uh, and that, again, would double the, the size. He didn't say what time frame that they were hoping uh, for. But, you know, of course, as you pointed out, different companies uh, have different responses to censorship in China. Google moved its servers uh, to Hong Kong. Um, because of uh, concerns about censorship and cyber attacks that by government-related groups. YouTube is banned in China. Facebook's uh, main social network is not accessible in China, so they can't see boobs uh, there through Facebook. Of course, they're banned on Facebook generally. And, uh, <laughs> and of course, Microsoft does uh, operate uh, its Bing search engine there, uh, and it is censored by the government. They've essentially uh, accepted that, and it hasn't helped them that much. They have a pretty small mind share. So uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what LinkedIn's strategy uh, does in terms of cooperating with the government also being available fully in, in uh, simplified Chinese language. I'm also interested in the cultural use of this. In the United States and sort of the Western world, it's perfectly acceptable to make entree to someone on a social network, right? But... Um, in certain Asian cultures, there's a lot more, I want to say, reverence for the authority of your elders and, and your superiors. And is it culturally acceptable to make introductions to people this way? And they already have, uh, I don't know the answer to that. I'm just sort of musing out loud. But they already have millions of users and a mobile app in Chinese. So um, it's, it's not a brand new marketplace for them. But I wonder if there are other tools that make it, I guess, more appropriate to their culture. Hmm. Interesting point. Well, um, we're going to uh, tell you about um, Aereo's uh, coming day in court. Uh, but first, I want to tell you about Squarespace. Squarespace is the uh, ultimate platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. And you should check it out right now by going to squarespace.com. I also noticed this morning that they have a new ad. They, they're really building some beautiful ads that have some great messages. And you can see those at blog.squarespace.com. And this ad, um, sort of like their Super Bowl ad that we've talked about before on this show, emphasize it sort of really takes a high road. Their point in this ad is that what matters on a, de on a website is all the little details. And of course, Squarespace takes care of those details from a design perspective, from a formatting perspective, and from a hosting perspective. So starting with the design, they have 25 beautiful templates for you to start with. So you just go in there, even if you don't know how to build a website, never done it before, you simply go in there and choose one of their uh, templates, pick the one you like best, and then you can modify and tweak it using their um, their editing tools. They even have something spectacular for small businesses. This is a brand new product that they have called a logo logo creator tool. It's a basic tool for any individual or small business uh, to create a logo from scratch that's completely unique for your business. And once you got it, of course, you can trademark it, and that can be your company logo. It's amazing that you can do this, uh, actually design with uh, with help from a service like this. It's, uh, it's astonishing. You, you can try it out uh, today if you'd like. And, uh, of course, if you need help, they have uh, tech support 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which is really, really good uh, tech support. And they're mobile-ready. 
A new Squarespace metric app for iPhone and iPad lets you check site stats like page views and unique visitors and social media follows. And they also have a blog app. So if you build a blog, you can make text updates, tap and drag images to change layouts, and monitor comments on the go. I mentioned they're mobile ready, but um, if you look at uh, the website on a, on a phone, on an Android phone, an iOS phone, on a tablet, any device, the, the page is completely reformatted and optimized for being viewed on those devices, which is super important because we're living in a mobile world. So your site has to have good performance and look good on a mobile device or you're going to have all kinds of problems uh, with customers thinking you don't know what you're doing. So if you know what you're doing, go to Squarespace. Start a free two-week trial with no credit card required and start building your website. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure you use the offer code TNT. Two, two for the month of February to get 10% off and also show your support for Tech News Today. And we thank Squarespace for their support of Tech News Today. And remember that a better web awaits and it starts with your new Squarespace website. Well, television broadcasters told the Supreme Court today in a court filing that Aereo, quote, threatens the very existence of broadcast television as we know it. That's probably true. Area of course, Aereo, of course, is a New York City-based company that enables customers to watch live and time-shifted TV by renting each one of them a little tiny antenna from which the video is streamed. And so this is, a, this is quite uh, an interesting case. Uh, we're going to be looking forward to it. Um, have you ever uh, used Aereo? Uh, I know you're in the New York area, Natalie. Um, what do you, what do you, uh, have you used it, and, and what do you think about this uh, service? No, I have not. But of course, I'm waiting like everyone else to see what happens. I think the broadcast networks look so petulant and childish over this case. Um, but now what they're saying is, you know, hey, if you let this through, this could make us seriously reconsider the things that we're offering for free to customers. We might not be able to do that anymore. So um, and then, you know, the argument there is our broadcast networks a public safety network? Are they something that's a utility? Is Are they something that we all should have the right to? So this is definitely a game changer and I'm watching with bated breath. I, I would like to see, you know, I I work for TV networks, but yeah. I do like to see them challenged. Um, sure. So I'm yeah. not going to say too much more because I work for NBC. Okay. Well, Dr. Mom in the, ch <laughs> Dr. Mom in the chat room says that, uh, that uh, she's used it and that it's excellent. So uh, that's a uh, yeah. I've one. never heard any user complaints about the mm -hmm. technology. I think yeah. it does exactly what it says it it's going to do. Yeah. So it's it's going to be an interesting case to boil down the two arguments to their very essence. The broadcasters say Aereo is simply stealing our content. Aereo says no. People can use antennas to watch TV. That's what that's the original way that people watch TV. We just have all the antennas in one room. And people uh, lease the antennas. And so we're just helping people legally watch uh, TV, which is their right. So we'll be watching this. Very interesting. The Supreme Court uh, is scheduled to hear arguments on this April 22nd. So we'll be revisiting this when they go to the Supreme Court. Well, Natalie, I want to thank you once again. Uh, and, of course, Natalie is here all week. But thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. I'll see you all tomorrow. You are an awesome co-anchor and uh really appreciate Thank you being you here very much and of course you're having a good time wonderful you can find natalie at nataliemorris.com and also on twitter at natalie morris that's natalie with i of course and uh and i'd like to thank you for tuning in today make sure you send your news tips to our email address at tnt at twit.tv or call 260 tnt show and leave a message also post and upvote your favorite stories on our subreddit at technewstoday.reddit.com and find the rest of our social pages by searching for Tech News Today on Twitter, Facebook, Google+, and YouTube. If you haven't already, subscribe to Tech News Today at twit.tv slash TNT and tune in to our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific and keep watching live.twit.tv all day for Mobile World Congress updates. My name is Mike Elgin and we will see you tomorrow.